And we're live. Okay. Kind of lost a little track of time here today. I don't mind telling you all. Um, I don't know what happened. It's just some, one of those days. Uh, hello. Took my uh, obligatory opening sip of water. And welcome to Geek Speaks Greek. I am your geek, George O'Connor. And what I do here, because I'm clearly speaking English, not speaking Greek, I each episode of Geek Speaks Greek, I talk about a different personage from Greek mythology, be they goddess, god, hero, or monster. Kind of do a little bit of an impromptu lecture with some notes, so it's not like I'm totally rambling off the top of my head, although today I'm getting dangerously close. And I kind of talk about this, what makes this particular spe uh, creature, you know, person, whatever from myth, so special. Do a little bit of live drawing, talk about my designs uh, as they may or maybe haven't appeared in my graphic novel series, Olympians Retelling Greek Mythology. And this week is a pretty exciting week because this week is the opening week of Redo. Now, what is this about? <laughs> okay, so um, let me talk a little bit because uh, some of you, I'm sure, have just started seeing the this, this show now. Some of you, maybe this is your first ever episode. Uh, started doing Geek Speaks Greek about the same time that we all were told to stay in our homes. Just as everything started getting spreading around, do all the craziness in the world right now. I was actually, uh, I started doing it to help out my local bookstore, my local independent bookstore, Word Books. Uh, one here in Brooklyn, one across the river in Jersey. Great independent bookstore. I love them dearly. And uh, this started out as something that was on their Instagram feed and like every day, because at first it was doing every day, which is like cuckoo bananas. I would uh, just choose a different uh, like mythological being to speak about. And the first episode like that I ever did was about today's subject, Apollo. Um, and unfortunately, because I really hadn't done something like this before, uh, we thought that this was something that was being saved. We had hit like a save button. Turns out it disappeared into the ether. If you don't hit like a certain button, as soon as it's finished, it doesn't save to your phone. You can record off a screen, but I didn't know that. So the first episode of Geek Speaks Greek was gone. Just totally gone. I kind of put the word out if anybody had for some reason saved it because somebody did like weirdly save the Minotaur episode, which I messed up too. But uh, the first two episodes are gone. Uh, in that first episode, I talked about Apollo and his son Asclepius. And it's crazy to me, like looking back now, as the show has gone on now for I'm pretty sure 3,000 years, right? Um, that I talked about two such major gods in one episode. And in fact, if you look at the first few episodes of Geek Speaks Greek, I do that. Like, I lump together, like, we talk about Artemis and Hestia in the same episode. We talk about Zeus and Kronos in the same episode. And now, as I've gotten into the groove of this, I'm like, good lord, I have so much to say about these guys. How did I ever, even, even someone who is comparatively minor as Asclepius compared to Apollo, like, I could probably do a week straight of just talking Apollo myths. Um, I'm not going to do that just yet. What I want to do here is get a little bit of uh, an oversight for people who catch this show after the fact on my YouTube. So we have something there. In fact, uh, this is a good time as any to plug. If you ever miss an episode of Geek Speaks Greek or want to go back and watch it again, please go to my YouTube, uh, user youtube.com slash user slash George Olympians. All the episodes are up there except for the first two. And hopefully we're rectifying that now. Uh, another thing I do each time is I start off sharing artwork. People have been sending me amazing amounts of artwork and amazing quality artwork to my email, georgeoconnorbooks at gmail.com. And before I jump too far into Apollo, because again, we, I, I've been getting, like, I'm so excited to see your guys' stuff because I, I literally do get more artwork than I could reasonably show. I guess I could show it to you guys, but it would be like the half the episode just be me holding up pictures. So, <laughs> okay, look at this one. This is, so it's backwards, apologize, it's a very low-tech show. There is Hephaestus in the background yelling at Eris. Uh, last weekend, we did, uh, not last weekend, last Friday, I did Eris, the goddess of causing trouble. And she's creating a little fire, and she's all like, woo. And he's like, stop that, because, you know, that's one of the many ways she causes trouble. This piece comes to us from, oh, here is the artist holding the art right there. That's a great drawing. Really captured the spirit of Eris. That is from Ilya. Hi, Ilya. Nice to see you. Uh, boy, there is so much stuff. Let's go through some of these things. Um, <laughs> speaking of words backwards, 
Uh, this is from Addie, who has written in before, and she's like, I've noticed the words are backwards. So she went, and she actually wrote backwards, which is uh, surprisingly hard. She did a great job. So uh, if you were looking this in person, this amazing portrait of Hecate, which is like, I really like Addie's style. Like, it's very much made it her own. Instantly, even if they had the name, we'd instantly know it was Hecate because of the two torches. Um, look, she's at a crossroads where it's splitting off. That's such a great detail. Oh, my gosh. Um, but, like, she, if you look at this in person, like, she wrote the words backwards, which, not easy. I, did, I actually had reason to do it recently. Uh, actually, the redo sign I did. Look how bad that looked. So, um... Here is some drawings from... Now, if you've been watching, you know that we always get... Uh, oh, I think I showed this one. Sorry. Let me... This is from a new person. This is from someone named Jackson. Uh, Jackson identifies himself as my biggest fan. So, let you all fight about this. Jackson drew... Oh, it's a little Hades. I don't know if you all have ever seen this. Um, something I've done... Uh, you could see... Uh, actually, I made sticker sets of it on my website... Uh, uh, GeorgeOConnorBooks.com. I designed a series of uh, Lil Olympians. I've done a few comics with them here and there for special publications and things. In fact, like this weekend is free comic book day. There was going to be a free comic book with some Olympian stories in it where you saw it had Lil Hermes and Lil Athena. I don't know what's happened with that now because it sure didn't come out because we're all stuck inside and it's sad. But unnecess it's necessary. All right, now, whoa, okay. This is uh, the brother-sister duo of Nora and Drake, who have given me lots of homework. <laughs> Not homework, artwork. Look at this amazing... This is from Nora. Look at this awesome Annis. Like, she's running, like, all over the place. Kind of like I drew a picture. Oh, it's going to be too hard to flip it, where she was jumping around. But this one, like, her tongue's out. She's, like, tousling her hair. She's being chased, if you look. There's a hand there. I wonder who's chasing her. Uh, let's see what else we have. Ah, here is the moment, because we talked about the most famous myth involving Eris is the judgment of Paris, when she throws the apple. And there is Aphrodite and Athena and Hera, all reaching all at once for the golden apple, for the most beautiful. If you want to hear more about that episode, tune in, because I have a lot to say about that episode. Now this is from Nora's brother, Drake. I think this is Eris, looking at the crazy smile, which I love it. Look at those teeth. Oh, and then there's... <laughs> Hey, this is pretty funny. This is Nora and Drake themselves, I think, acting like Edis. Look how crazy they look. Crazy in a good way. Like, you know, you have to be a little crazy in order to have fun. Let's do a few more pictures. Um, oh, this is, remember uh, Jackson, who I just showed you a few moments ago? He did a little uh, Hades. Turns out I've never drawn a little Edis. So he drew a little heiress. Actually, she might be little. She might be full-grown heiress. But that's a great heiress. Again, everyone drawing her jumping around. I love this. Like, that really... That's... I was saying, the whole secret to drawing her is you have to draw her energy because she's cuckoo bananas that way. Um, let's see. This one is from Moira, who... Uh, she had joined us last week. She had sent us that really cool scene where it was like... It was... Um, oh, nobody really drew much of Metis. Oh, poor Metis. She's always forgotten. Metis, the Oceanid and, uh, Anity, and she's on shore. One of her sisters is in the water. And Helios, the sun, was looking over her head. So um, here she's given us another scene. She likes to draw the whole vista, right? And there in that little figure is Edis just causing trouble. Like a little bit more trouble than she normally gets away with. Although I guess causing the Trojan War is pretty big trouble. But it looks like she started a little fire and has created like a huge conflagration. And there's Helios again watching. And he's kind of, I mean, he's a big ball of fire. He's probably like not too upset by it. Um... Oh, okay. So uh, we all remember my fan, Megan, who does a lot of like these drawings. She's the one that ships together uh, Hermes and Athena, has created like a whole family for them of really well thought out and like I totally buy it that they'd be their kids. So um, here she is drawing Aphrodite and her numerous suitors amongst the Olympians. I like it because if you read myths, there are myths where Dionysus and her have a kid. Hermes and her definitely have kids. Uh, Poseidon, I don't know that they ever, like, I show in the book that he's kind of interested. I don't know if there's ever a story they hook up. Of course, Ares, poor Hephaestus isn't here. But look at Artemis. She's all kind of shy. Why is Artemis so shy there? And it's kind of funny because she continues that with some other drawings. First off, I just, look at this one. This is like the coolest band that ever lived. Like, look at these great portraits of the three most powerful Olympian goddesses. That's Athena looking over her shoulder, uh, Aphrodite setting this right in the eye, and then, like, this kind of, look at that haughty look on, on Hera. I love this. Like, that's such a great composition. 
And then this one, here's why we see. Here is all oh, Artemis is being made very shy by Aphrodite. Now, reading between the lines, I think she maybe ships a little bit. I think she thinks Artemis has a crush on Aphrodite, and who could blame her? But it might also be that she, maybe Aphrodite's shirt is too revealing. I don't know. There's some cute stuff going on here. Megan, amazing work as always. And uh, let's do... Now, this one is interesting. I actually didn't even get a chance to see this one, because, like, all right, so... If you've been watching, you know I've mentioned, so I'm working on the final Olympians book, uh, Dionysus, right now. And I'm going to be moving from there into doing a four-book series on the Norse myths called Asgardians. And Yehi, who writes to us from Korea, sent us this picture. Because it came up in a question. I don't remember who asked it. Would Loki like Eris? And she has, it's, in, it's backwards so you can't see. She says, Loki hates Eris. Look at that great Loki. That's an amazing Loki. That looks really great. It actually looks kind of similar to my design for Loki, which you can see some of the pictures on my Instagram. I haven't posted too much. And Eris is kind of... And that was kind of the... I think that was the decision I came to, that the thing would be... They're both troublemakers, but I think Loki's a little bit more malicious, and I think Eris just can't help herself. Like, she just kind of just... You know, her. that's her nature. She causes trouble. So... There was a lot more stuff I didn't get to show, including work by those same artists. Like some people just are machines. Like they just like create so much stuff, machines in the best way. And some artists didn't have a chance to show. So I'm really sorry if you send in stuff you didn't get to see it, but please do keep sending it. Uh, send it to me at my email, georgeoconnorbooks at gmail.com. Um, if I skipped you like this week and you send me another one, I mean, I'll definitely make sure like to get you in the next episode. So as I hit my drawing board, <clears throat> let's do this. Let's talk about Apollo. Man, okay. So, as the first god. Now, it's kind of hard to think he's not the first god. He was the first god in the series. I should finish my sentences. It's kind of hard to think of a, a, a god who is kind of having more of a moment, given the current world status, than Apollo. And that's why I led off with him the first time. So, he's one, like, as one of the big 12 Olympians, and I think you've all noticed this by now. There's this tendency people kind of like will almost stereotype the Olympians like Hermes is the messenger god or whatever. But an Olympian, as such a super powerful god, one of the most important gods, they have a lot of things they're in charge of. And so like, you know, I think all you guys are big fans that you could list off tons of things that they're gods, that, like that they're the representative, the god of. It's not just like lightning or water. Like there's many other things. Apollo is the god of both plagues and diseases and healing. So right there, he's got that as a big connection. He's the god of like creative expression, like music and poetry and song, which I guess is the same thing as music, so I'm just repeating myself, which is something that's been giving a lot of solace to people right now. A lot of people have been finding comfort in creative endeavors, right? He's the god of prophecy, which I threw in that one, because that was A, it was super important in his role back in the day, but it's also like right now, what's making this time so weird and scary is that we don't know how it's gonna end and we can't tell the future. And Apollo, he can. Like that's one of his deals. You know, him, Prometheus, Zeus actually we had some ability for that. But Apollo, he was like the guy, he was the guy behind the Oracle of Delphi. That was the most famous oracle in the world. Like kings for years, centuries, would make decisions about world events based on what the Pythia, the princess, uh, the, princess the priestess at Delphi would tell them. She was channeling the words of Apollo. So he was this oracular god. And then this is one that maybe people don't know about Apollo. It's one of like the lesser known attributes. Apollo is a god of, I'm going to say assembly, not building stuff. Um, although I guess he builds poetry and things. He's like the god of people coming together. Specifically, like, like in, like, a, a political sense in many ways. Like, just the idea of, like, people coming together and voicing their opinions in a city setting. He's also the predict protector, much like his, his sister Artemis, he's a protector of young people. Um, he kind of handles the boy side of things. Like, he was, like, the protector of a boy until he became of age. So, that part maybe less specifically, but the idea that he is like the idea of coming together in public. So much of this stuff ties in right now. Now, I joke about Apollo a lot. And uh, I thought one of the things I should do, because Apollo is such a big major god, that I really could do a week about him easy. 
And honestly, like I was thinking about this series going forward. I mentioned up front how a lot of the early gods, I kind of crammed them in like multiple ones in an episode where I barely said anything about them. So the idea of the uh, the redo, probably going to end up doing more redos as we go. This whole week is going to be redos of ones whose episodes are specifically lost. But eventually I'm going to be doing episodes where I explore, as this continues, if this continues, we'll see how long people keep watching. As we... Uh, as we go on, I'll be exploring more deeper facets of different goddesses and gods that we've covered already. I might even do it as way where I focus on specific myths. Like I'll talk about like, you know, cause you, you, you know what? I could do like an episode a week about Zeus and not get every one of his, epi all of his myths in there, but maybe like just spotlight spe specific versions of him, specific aspects of him. And I feel like today with Apollo, <clears throat> I'm trying to give a little bit of a, a over assembly of him assembly, an overview of him, but uh, I'm going to kind of spotlight on a few different spots, right? So my own relation to Apollo, I'll be honest, he was one of my least favorite of the Olympians. Um, I was kind of put off by his casual cruelty. He's, uh, I mentioned this a lot, um, in, in stories, you find like this famous story of Marsyas. Marsyas is a satyr who's playing on a, a double flute and he's like, I'm the best musician in the world. And Apollo hears this, he's like, oh yeah, I am. And like he challenges him to a music contest. And when Apollo, Apollo wins, because of course he wins, he's an Olympian, he makes a bet with him and like, and like he doesn't tell him the deals. He pulls off Marsyas' skin, he skins him alive. And I'm like, ah, that's a little bit much. Marsyas didn't do anything that bad. Okay, dumb move. Don't say you're the greatest musician, especially better than Apollo. I, advice I say again and again, don't attract the attention of a, an Olympian or a Greek god at all. Just don't. Just don't. If you do, try to be as humble as possible, get out of the way. And so um, when I did the Olympian series, and I'm still doing it, but I, when I laid it all out, like starting, I started working in this series, I think back in 2008. That's how long I've been working on this. When I laid out the whole series of where we come, I put Apollo kind of right in the middle. He and Ares as the two gods I personally was the most mm, about. I didn't have a great feeling for them because I wanted to save a lot of gods and goddesses I liked towards the end. So it's something to look forward to. I wanted to get a lot of the ones I really liked up front because, you know, you were more excited to do that. And then I put the two guys that was kind of like, eh, a bit in the middle. But my view of both of them changed drastically as a result of doing the book. I spend a lot of time researching the goddess, goddesses, and everybody in these books. And sometimes I come away with the idea, like with Theseus, I'm like, oh, Theseus, you're terrible. But in the case of all the Olympians, I kind of get in their head and I realize where they're about. And Apollo has gone from being one of my least favorites to one of my favorites now. Because... There's no denying he's cruel and he's a jerk and he's creep and all this stuff. But you know what? All of us are sometimes. Sometimes I'm a creep. Sometimes I'm a jerk. Sometimes I'm cruel. Um, probably you all are too if you're not good for you. But we all have our moments. And Apollo, I kind of got his personality why he is that way. So um, let me actually take a moment to draw Apollo. I was actually looking for the original drawing I did during his episode, and I couldn't find it, like his first episode. And I think I maybe didn't actually draw during that first episode, because I found a bunch of his artwork from his book I'd pulled. I'm like, did I just show pictures? I don't know. It's weird. So let's draw Apollo. I always say this about Apollo, and it's absolutely true. In my version of him, it's a kind of thin line I have to draw between making him look very handsome and giving him a smile, but also making him look like he's going to murder you. Because I feel like that's kind of the way Apollo is. He's a little bit, well, to use a term that's actually made to describe his brother, he's mercurial. He's kind of like all over the place sometimes. So I try to make him very good looking. I gave him a little bit more of a slender face than some of the other gods. He has really good cheekbones. Oh, it's up like kind of, you can't see it so great. Now, this is where we could get into one of my first stories I want to talk about him. I Depending on the time frame, but if it's, because uh, there's a personal time frame, I've talked about this, the chronology of the gods really matters to me for some reason. Um, if it's later in that, he almost always has his laurel wreath, which I just drew in here. And um, this is a story just to kind of tell, to really get his personality across. Uh, the laurel wreath is part of a woman he liked. I know, gross, right? Let's tell really quickly the story of Daphne. 
Daphne was a nymph, uh, very beautiful, um, dedicated more to like the Artemisian side of things. She didn't want, she did, she had no interest in marriage or, you know, dating or children or anything like that. She wanted to run wild and free and be by herself. And Apollo sees this and he's like, she's pretty. And Apollo, he doesn't know to take no for an answer. And this is not, I'm not saying that, I just finished saying oh, I like him. This is why I don't like him, okay? This is the part that's really hard to support. So Apollo comes down and he puts on his smoothest god charm. And Apollo is, I mean, there's no doubt, myth after myth after myth, like attest to the fact that he was beautiful. And I use the term beautiful, like he really kind of like, like was beautiful. Like he's not handsome as much. Like that was more like Aries territory, right? Apollo was like the embodiment of like young male beauty. And he, he, he was honestly, it was a little bit on like the feminine side even. He kind of like crosses the lines. But to see Apollo, you're just like, you would see him, you're like, that's one of the most beautiful people I've ever seen. So he comes down, he's used to be like, hey, how you doing, lady? And she's like, uh, get away from me, I don't like guys, I don't like anyone, just get away from me, okay? And he doesn't take that for a no, because Apollo, the secret to Apollo, his personality, the thing that is so fascinating about the Olympians and the Greek gods and the heroes and monsters and yada, da 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 is they're based on real personalities. And Apollo kind of overcompensates, because Apollo had a rough childhood. I'll get back to that. But Apollo, it wounded his ego. This woman turned away from him. He's like, no. So he starts chasing her. And she's running. And he runs too. Now, Apollo's super fast. Um, we'll see. I'll talk about this more on Wednesday's episode about Hermes. Like, he's able to keep up with baby Hermes. There's even one myth where he beats Hermes at the Olympics, which I'm like, that's no way. But he's really fast. He's an Olympian. He could run like, you know, he's like, like you know, the Flash or Quicksilver. He's super fast. He starts chasing her, and she's just a nymph. She knows she can't escape him. And depending on the version of the story, sometimes she prays to Mother Earth, Gaia, Grandmother Earth. Sometimes she prays to her father, who was this river spirit. But she knows she's not going to be escape him. And she knows he's going to catch her, and he's a god. She can't do anything to stop him. So she prays to be saved in the only way that they can stop. And as they're running, she turns into a tree. Daphne becomes the first laurel tree. She just transform, transformed. There's some really amazing art of this. Uh, I especially recommend the Bernini sculpture. It's like the most amazing sculpture in the world. It's Apollo chasing Daphne and like mid, like she's mid turning into a bark. It's this incredible 3D sculpture. You walk around it, everything is great. He has this look of dawning like huh, on his face just as he's touching her and she's like, her fingers are sprouting into branches. Her hair starting to leaves. There's bark shooting up her body. It's the best sculpture ever except for the same one Bernini did of Hades capturing, carrying off Persephone, but amazing. Um, and then this is the part that's just like unforgivable. Like, I mean, so that's bad enough. She turns into a tree. She's still alive, but she traded away all her human dreams and thoughts and f well, nymph, but still like mobility to become a tree to escape this guy. And he still so doesn't get it that he actually, he's like, Oh, but I will always love you, Daphne. And he, breaks a piece of her off, like some of the leaves. We saw that in the Bernini, that came out of her fingers. It's like taking off her fingernails. I don't know, maybe one of her fingers. Maybe it's another part of her body. And he makes this like laurel wreath for her. And he keeps making new laurel wreaths. So like, I f imagine like every couple days he goes down there and picks another piece of Daphne off. It's like, ah. <sighs> okay, so I got, <laughs> I didn't really do notes for this episode, so there is a chance I'm going to get a little rambly. I'm like, wow, I just kind of like, I started saying I'm not going to dump him, and then we came up with this terrible story. So let's give a little background history, because I talked about how he, um, he had a bad childhood. He is the twin uh, brother, I almost said sister, of Artemis. They are the children of Leto and Zeus. Now, Zeus, we all know. We talk about Zeus every episode because everyone's related to Zeus pretty much, right? Leto is the daughter of, I guess she's like, she might be considered a Titan. She kind of falls into that Promethean range where she's like the son, uh, she's the daughter of Titans. She is the daughter of um, either, his name His name is either Cetus or I, in my books, use the name Polos just to make it a little bit more distinct. He was the Titan of the North, like the North Pole, get it? And Phoebe. And uh, Leto, and then um, Leto has an affair with Zeus. Um, by all, you know, so this is while Zeus is already married to Hera. 
So um, I kind of tied this into my books where this is happening at the same time while Hera is pregnant with Hephaestus. So basically she's having the world's worst pregnancy while like her husband is off like having an affair with this other woman. She's in this land called Hyperborea which was up in the far, far north. It meant above the northern winds. So it's like in the Arctic Circle or something, but they didn't know about the Arctic Circle. You know what I'm saying? It's like this magical land. It's kind of shrouded from the view of the gods. So she thinks she's protected, but Hera can see. And so Leto, realizing she's in danger, she's carrying the children of Zeus, the king of gods, and he has a super powerful wife who's going to be really mad about this. She becomes a wolf. And she comes out of Hyperborea and starts wandering, but Hera is able to see through her disguise. She has the eyes of an Olympian. They can see whatever she needs to see, right? Um, and Hera sends these different agents of hers to plague Leto, that she can't give birth safely anywhere. She uh, sends uh, Ares himself in some versions of the myth. She sends her, her personal messenger, Iris. But most famously, she sends Python. Python is this giant snake from before the Olympians times. It's where we get the name Python from. And it's where I mentioned Apollo's priestesses, the Pythia. They're from there too. One of Apollo's most famous myths is when he kills Python in retribution for this. So Leto is never able to rest. And furthermore, Hera puts this, like this, she, ca she tells the whole world as one of the most powerful gods. She's like, you are not allowed, the world is not allowed to give you any sort of, to Leto, she says, you're not allowed to get any sort of rest. You are not allowed to give birth anywhere on dry land. So she spends, like, normal pregnancy is nine months. Leto is pregnant for way longer than nine months, carrying two children in her belly, being chased by a giant snake, and occasionally a winged rainbow goddess, and also the god of war. And her life is awful, and she can't rest anywhere, and she's just walking, walking, walking. And then finally, she finds an island. Poseidon plays a part in this. He helps out. That is kind of floating just beneath the ocean. It's not attached to the bottom. It's just like kind of a landmass that's a couple, maybe a foot or two beneath the water. So because that's not dry land, she's able to give birth there. And clinging to one palm tree, she gives birth like that to Artemis. And then... 11 days later, because Apollo has to make things difficult because he doesn't want to come out because it's wet and cold and rainy. Artemis has to serve as the handmaid. She gives birth. She helps her mother give birth to Apollo. So they're twins who are like 11 days apart, which has got to be a world record, right? Um, so that sort of colors Apollo's perceptions, right? He's always been this kind of like right from the start, he was persecuted before he's even born. He doesn't meet his dad until a few years later when he's a younger boy. And, like, it, it, I think it puts a real chip on his shoulder. And here's the thing that's about Apollo that I think is super interesting. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to draw, because I didn't like that picture of Apollo. I want to draw, like, a full body shot of Apollo. Kind of the same way when I was talking about with Eris, it's kind of important to get in her um, body language. I feel like with Apollo it is, too. Like, his face, I could have that kind of casual cruelty in it. But it's, it's kind of subtle, hard to read. I like drawing his body where there's a kind of relaxation in it. And also, you have to be able to show like the arrogance. Because while Apollo feels very persecuted, one of the reasons why this is so loathsome to him is because he feels he's better than that. He shouldn't have been persecuted. He's the son of Zeus, but for goodness sake. How's that? Yeah, I'm literally not nailing Apollo today. I'm doing some stinky drawings. It's okay, guys. Everyone draws. Sometimes your drawings just aren't very good. So the one last thing I want to talk about Apollo, um, I kind of mentioned like the things he's, you know, God of healing. Uh, that's kind of something that's more like really the story with like his son Asclepius, but he plays a part in that. He's definitely the God of bringing pestilences and plagues. Like very famously, uh, the Iliad opens where the, the Achaeans, the Greeks, their camp is being ravaged by plagues that Apollo sent on them. But something you may have heard about Apollo, and maybe you haven't, but I think it's a really fascinating thing. People will say Apollo is the most Greek of all the gods. And like, what does that mean, right? To me, that's a very interesting idea. And it's like this. So a cool thing I do in almost all these episodes, or I think it's cool, maybe you don't think it's cool, but I think a cool thing about Greek mythology is uh, its parallels with Roman mythology and how the same divinities uh, will be, you could see them reflected through the, the Roman lens and they'll have different names.
Uh, we spoke a lot about Hera. She's Juno in the Roman religion. Uh, Zeus is either Jehovah or Jupiter. Uh, Hermes, who we talked about, is Mercury. They all have these different names, except for Apollo. Apollo doesn't have the other name. Even the gods who kind of don't seem to at first, like if you look at Dionysus, like he's called Bacchus both in Romans and Greeks, but he has another name that the Romans like call him. He was Libra, Li Liber, or, you know, Pater Liber. Or Hades, who is often called Pluto by the uh, Romans, but that's also a Greek name. Like that's also, like, but he has other names like Orcus or Dis. Um, Apollo is just Apollo. There's no other spot where he's got this other name. And that's because he didn't have that equivalent. So I've mentioned this before, but it's always fascinating to me. The thing about a pantheon, a pantheistic religion, which means theai means gods, right? Pan means all the gods. So a lot of religions nowadays have one God and they're very much like, there's only one God. And if you believe in other gods, that's literally a sin. That's wrong. The Romans and other pantheistic societies didn't think that way. At least not first. The Romans eventually did. But, um, when you believe in a society with a lot of gods, you believe a lot of gods are real. And so, like, the Greeks had all their gods, their Olympians and whatnot. And then the Romans had all their gods. But for whatever reason, they didn't have an Apollo. They didn't have the equivalent. You know, like, the Greeks have Hephaestus, they have Vulcan. Greeks have Athena, they had Minerva. No Apollo equivalent. Then, in Rome, I think it's in the 100 BCE... 150 BCE, I think it is. Maybe 157, that date jumped to mind. They had a plague. <clears throat> yeah, it swept through the city. People got sick. People were dying. And what the Romans would do, because the Romans were such a clever people, they're like, we're being decimated. Well, they probably were being de decimated. means killing one-tenth. Maybe that's accurate in this one. It's a Roman word meaning killing one-tenth of people. We're being decimated, perhaps. Maybe worse, maybe less. A lot of our citizens are being killed by this plague. We don't really have a god that's a native god that deals with this. But these Greeks, they have Apollo. He's the god of plagues. He's also the god of healing them. So what they did on the banks of the river Tiber, they built a temple to Apollo. And they would do stuff like this with other gods too. One of the things I think is really fascinating, if the Romans came up against, say they were fighting another city-state, and like they, say they worshipped uh, Fred, the god of uh, toilet paper, right? And they like were like, well, we don't have Fred. They would build a temple to Fred so that they could get his favor too. Because you don't want to fight against, a pe it's bad enough fighting a war, that's hard already, but fighting against another people and their god, but if you make their god like you, and because you're Romans, you probably make a better temple than these people. So they made this temple to Apollo. And Apollo, because he's this later addition, because like, I think a lot of us tend to think of like, you know, like you, you have the Greek gods first and the Romans just copied them, right? But that's not really accurate. The Romans copied the Greek gods' stories, but their gods were there already. It was, it's actually, I mean, they really are the same gods under different names. Just the Romans weren't very, they weren't fanciful. They weren't really fabulous. They didn't make up stories the way the Greeks did. So after they had these established deities going back beyond, we actually have a record for. Like most of these gods are so old. It's just like the Greeks, they kind of go into the distant past. We don't know where they came from. They started matching them up and they taking those stories. And sometimes they were very close matches. Um... Mercury and Hermes, very close, very no difference in the characters. Sometimes the difference in the characters was quite marked, like Ares and Mars. Ares is kind of like a jerk in Greek, but Mars, the Roman equivalent, they loved him. Like he was a major god with a lot of good qualities. But Apollo, because he comes in later after all this stuff, he's just Apollo. And so he gets this title as the most Greek of heroes, be, uh, of gods, because he doesn't have that Latinized version. The Latinized version is just Apollo, just the version that they took from the Greeks. But because he covers such important areas, because he covers healing and plagues and art and music and people coming together in government and stuff, which we know a lot of that happened in Rome, he quickly assumes this level of importance equal to Apollo's level in Greeks. I mean, in general, the Greeks did have a big influence where certain gods, the Olympians, elevated, and that was definitely due to the Greek influence, and he certainly benefits from that. One last thing to say about Apollo, because, uh, I, like I said, there's a million things to say about him, and I could talk about him all day. I want to talk about the idea of Apollo as god of the sun. Because if you ask an average person on the street, 
who's the god of the sun? They're going to say Apollo. Now, the real myth people will be like Helios, or if they're like Latinized myth people, they'll be like Sol. But, like, Apollo as god of the sun, that's something that happens even later than his introduction to Rome. You start seeing, in Greece, he starts getting associated with the sun pretty long ago, but he, they're still different. There's no confusion. Helios is one guy. He is literally the sun. Apollo has some connections to him. Apollo has a connection to light. He's radiant. He's beautiful. And also then, at the same time, his twin sister, she actually kind of leads the way. Artemis ends up having a very strong connection to the moon. And um, that's due to her strong connection to, to women. Women have a strong connection to the moon. And so you have this, this connection drawn between Artemis and the moon very early on. So it becomes kind of obvious that her radiant brother, who is about light, he ends up having a connection to the sun. And you'll see some places, you know, he's often called Phoebus Apollo. Some places he'll be called maybe Apollo Helios, like Apollo of the sun. But it's not until much, much later, like really at the end of like the pagan era, like in Rome, like around the fifth century of the of the common era, the, the era we're living in now, that's about maybe the fourth century. I might be putting it back a little bit late. But as people are just about like paganism is about to become a dirty word and it's about to be like all Christianity all the time, you kind of see at that point he has become the god of the sun. It's like one of the last things. The Olympians were always growing, always expanding, always sucking smaller and like similar deities under their tutelage, you know? Not tutelage, that makes it like they're doing it like in a good way. Like they're always like absorbing them. And it continued for Apollo right up until the point where most people stopped believing in these gods. Um, you know, maybe another dimension over, Apollo is the one that's like the big, like number one god here because of that, who knows? Because like his relationship with the sun in late Roman antiquity, there was Sol Invictus and all this stuff. Like the sun worship became a very big thing and Apollo was almost there. But you know, things shook out differently. Um, I feel like I want to draw at least one picture of Apollo that's not stinky today. And then while I'm doing this, this is a good chance for you to start assembling your questions and answers. So I'm going to do, let's just try a head-on picture of Apollo. So I'll talk a little bit about my design of Apollo too. I mentioned he has to kind of look a little sinister, like he's going to kill you. Um, Apollo, I gave him... This is, I'm going to talk some color notes. He has brown eyes. Um, I give him brown eyes because he is weirdly a god of the people. That idea that he's the most Greek, he represents the body of the people. Brown eyes is the most common eye color, so I thought that he should be representative of that way. Um, I talked about the um, connection he and his sister have with the sun and the moon. And they are twins. So a lot of people have written to me over the years being like, why don't you give Artemis blonde hair? Shouldn't she have black hair? She's like a goddess of the night. And I'm like, I see where you're coming from. But I actually picture her colors as being like moonlit colors. And Apollo's colors, again, you're gonna have to, I'm going to draw this as younger Apollo where he wears his hair down in his face. Because I want to point something out about that. Um, Apollo is always colored in my books like he's standing in the midday sun. He's very warm, golden colors. He has very dark skin, very tanned. Um, golden hair, though, because that's something that's actually specifically mentioned. He's called Golden Haired Apollo in a few instances. Um, and then because he had the golden hair and I wanted them to be twins, I gave Artemis the blonde hair that looks like moonlit. And she's always colored like she's in the nighttime colors. Like she's very soft, like almost washed out colors. So this is a younger Apollo I drew. Um, I kind of drew it just because I wanted to point out. So I've gone out of my way to give them a bit of a familial resemblance. All the Olympians have like the certain sort of nose. They got a little crook and stuff. If you look at Apollo without being colored in, he kind of looks like Hades, right? Which maybe is a limitation of my artistic abilities, but I think is actually just to show that there's, I mean, Hades is his uncle, right? They should make some sense, right? But there's a very similarity there to the um, appearance. I'm going to leave this one because that's the first picture of Apollo drew today that didn't, Looks stinky. So um, let's see. Where did Apollo get his bow? That's the first question I see. So when Apollo first meets his um, father, Zeus, he is gifted the bow. He's able to ask for things he wants. It's kind of like a little addendum. The story is really about his sister. She comes up, and I cover this in the um, Artemis episode, which I'll have to redo eventually because there's so much more to say about her. But um, 
like she like is like I want like a, a bow, I want twenty oceanities and forty dogs and all this stuff. She knows everything she wants. And Apollo's like, yeah, I'll take a bow too. And like they're like they're kind of like it's I've seen them both being um mentioned as the creators of archery, which doesn't make sense because how they ask for a bow if they haven't if there wasn't archers already. I mean, whatever. But um I think he gets it. It's never said. I assume he gets it from Hephaestus. Which, because Hephaestus is the guy who makes stuff for everybody, right? And it's like this really great silver bow uh, or gold bow, depending on the version. Um, it makes sense to me that it would have been Hephaestus. But honestly, I'm not sure that that's a particularly 100% definitively covered. Um, is that a drawing of Artemis in your profile pic? Ooh, which profile pic? Are we talking the one here on Instagram? I don't remember. I think... It's a picture of Hermes, but it might not be. I don't know. I mean, I've certainly drawn pictures of Artemis. She's certainly around. Um, uh, let's see. How old was Apollo when he went up to Olympus? That's a great question. So in my book, I think I drew him looking like he was maybe about somewhere between six to ten years old. Okay? Now, time passes very differently for gods. Um heck his sister artemis like i said there's an 11 day difference between when she was like when she came out and when he did she had to grow herself up in that 11 days very quickly so she wouldn't be like an, in, an a helpless infant she had to grow herself up to like help her mom deliver her brother so he had the form of like a six to ten year old somewhere in there he's like a prepubescent boy but was it actually that long i don't know was it longer they're gods. They don't age the same way as we do. You know, some gods like Hermes, he's born and as a baby, he keeps the baby form. He's already like the smartest god. So like they're all over the place. So I personally believe it's, I feel like after they're born, they kind of aged at a normal time. I don't think this was an accelerated birth situation. I, I mean, accelerated aging version where like sometimes the gods grow up overnight. I think they needed to wait a few years so that Hera wasn't so mad that she attacked them right away. So I think he really is, I think he's about, I would guess he's about seven years old, judging from my pictures. I'm really bad at like telling how old kids are, by the way, it's a fun, as a, as a non-dad, uh, no idea how old children are, just no idea. Which is weird, because like, like I spend all my time like writing books for kids, but who knows. Um, which Hogwarts house do you think the Olympian twins would be in? Ooh, we did an episode a while ago. It was very contentious, where I ended up breaking down who, where I thought different characters would be in. I don't remember what I said, and I'm almost certain what I'm going to say now is different. Because of his strong attract, the way snakes play an important part in his mythology, his princess is literally, I mean, his, I keep saying that, his priestess is literally named Pythia. He killed Python. He's got a real dark side. He's... Super talented, though. I think he is Slytherin. Also, I'm Slytherin. But, um, and then Artemis. Well, she's definitely not Hufflepuff. She's, I don't think she's Slytherin either. I think they're in different houses. Um, she doesn't seem very studious. She doesn't seem very jockish, because that's how I view it. I view the Gryffindors. They're like, look at us. Oh. Um, I'm going to say she's Ravenclaw because everybody's Ravenclaw. Right? Well, actually, yeah, everybody's Ravenclaw. Um, the Greek summer bod. Uh, why do you see them sometimes see Apollo with Apollo with N at the end? It's Greek. Yeah, a lot of the Greek. So what the names we're saying are like english transliterations of these names and sometimes i try to lean heavier onto the greek pronunciations um i actually got somebody once asking like well, who is this hedda you keep talking like h-e-d-d-a i'm like oh i'm saying hera but i'm saying it like i'm trying to greek it up a little bit so yeah with the um a lot of greek pronunciations there actually it would be like apollon pluton there's like this kind of it's hard for me to say i'm not really doing it but there is a little bit of an n at the end and just we don't, I mean, we just haven't, so some, it, it is, it's a Greek thing, is the short thing, yeah. It's just, I should be Apollon, I think that's how you would pronounce it. No, I'm not quite, it's the syllable's wrong. Apollon, I think it's Apollon, I don't know. Somebody who speaks Greek better than I should come in here. 
Uh, yeah, actually, somebody. Apollon is the Greek version, while Apollo is the Latin translation. Yeah, it's it's the Latinized version, and you'll you'll note it. That's like I try in a lot of instances to kind of um, undo Latinized versions in my spellings. That's why Hephaestos is H-E-P-H-A-I-S-T-O-S in my books. Dionysos is D-I-O-N-Y-S-O-S. Anytime you see the U-S, that's pretty much at the end. That's pretty much a Latinized version. Sometimes I didn't. I wish I'd been more spe- a little bit coherent. Like Olympus. I wish I'd done O-S. But at the time when I started the series, I didn't think people were ready for it. Um, so I, I did it. And I'm, I, that's a regret I have now. It should be Olympus. But yeah, it's it's kind of like the U.S. is like the Latinized version of it. Um, oh, somebody wrote, I think Apollo's uh, bow came from the Cyclopes, like Artemis's. That's actually a good bet. You know what? It might have been the Cyclopes. You know, I should probably read my own books, it probably says. <laughs> um, did Hermes and Apollo give it along uh, how they first met? So, yeah, I'm happy to say uh, one of my favorite friendships in Greek mythology is the bro relationship between Apollo and Hermes. And um, it's it's one of the reasons that I've really enjoyed writing him because he's a really good foil for Hermes. Uh, most of the scenes in my books, Hermes is either paired up with his dad, who is his dad. You can't joke around with your dad that much. and Or he's teamed up with Athena, who is his intellectual equal and a little bit drier than him. She's not, he's not able to joke with her the same way. He could get a couple little snips in maybe, but she's not going to respond to it the same way. But Apollo is kind of, I've said this before. If you look at the way that they comport themselves on a, like just a, you know, quotidian daily basis, he's arguably the least bright Olympian. He's certainly brilliant, like musically, artistically, but he, he, he kind of like, Gets, there's a lot of stories where Apollo is kind of just being kind of thick. And so it's really fun to play that off of where he's a little bit of a stuffed shirt. He's a little pompous. He feels like everybody doesn't give him enough respect, so he's got a real chip on his shoulder about it. And Hermes is his little brother who just kind of eggs him on a little bit. But they do really seem to enjoy each other. And there are some myths where you see like they just kind of like, like this isn't just me, like the ancient mythographers, they would team those two guys up. Like they were like, I, they're like the two young dudes hanging out. Like Ares was also a young guy and Hephaestus, but they had their own issues. They were like the two just bros hanging out. My favorite bit is um, in the when Hephaestus spins his invisible net and captures uh, his wife Aphrodite and Ares together, exposing their affair. And in the original story, is it by Callimachus? I don't remember who it is. But like in the original myth, recounting it, like Apollo and Hermes are all like, they're joking like, hey, would you want to be there too? That I mean, it's worth it, right? It's Aphrodite. Um, it's kind of funny. I really enjoy their relationship. Um, have I ever drawn Cassandra? Uh, I think there is one panel I don't remember if it made it into the fav- in the finished book. Do I? Oh, I do have it here. Let me see. I think there is one panel of Ares where you see her very small in the background. And unless you really know the story, you wouldn't get that's what was happening. And uh, no, it's actually not. I, I cut it out. <laughs> so, there was a scene. so I have drawn Cassandra just never in one of my books. So that would be maybe I'll do an upcoming week where I do... Um, I did, uh, what, like maybe two weeks ago, maybe three weeks ago, because time has no meaning anymore. I did a uh, a week where I designed goddesses that never actually appeared in Olympians or only appeared in one panel. Maybe I'll do one where it's uh, like heroines or heroes that have never really appeared in Olympians. And Cassandra would be a pretty interesting one to do there. She's only got really the one big story, but it's a very big story. So I think I could do that. Uh, ah. Mr. Succulent adds, in later writings, Apollo says that he'll never love another immortal more than he loves Hermes. Well, see, that's super cute. I like that. Um, if you could, hey, if you could send me, I would love, um, I'm a big guy for citations. If you could send me that myth, like any place where you could find it, uh, like just a listing, I'll find it. Send it to me here at georgeoconnorbooks.gmail.com. I want to do some research on that because that's a really cool little bit. Um, are you ever going to draw a grown-up version of Eros? Yes, I already have designs for it, in fact. 
um, I've maybe mentioned this in the past, but um, there was originally in the Aphrodite book, there was going to be a retelling of Eros and Psyche. And uh, I ended up cutting that and the book got restructured as a result. So Eros came out of that as a baby and he's just been, I've only ever pictured him as a baby in the series since. But I do intend, he's one of the, I mention often how um, ideally after I finish As Guardians, I'm going to come back and maybe once a year do a Greek mythology book, graphic novel, just like Olympians, not called Olympians, where it would give me more freedom to explore other facets of myth. And one of the ones that's right at the top of the list is I want to do an Eros and Psyche with a grown-up Eros. And the design of him, I mean, you could kind of figure it out. I mean, he looks very similar, just, you know, he's filled out. He's not like a little fat baby anymore, but he's still... He's still definitely the same dude. Maybe I'll jump. Maybe I'll uh, do that. Oh wait, I haven't done an Eros episode, guys. Gonna have to do an Eros episode. All right, this week's already spoken for. By the way, really quickly as we're nearing the end of the cutoff, uh, the schedule for this week. Uh, we did Apollo today. Redo, but there's so much more to say about Apollo. I'm sure we'll visit other myths of him in the future. Wednesday is going to be Hermes, who is the star of the second episode of Geek Speaks Greek, which was also lost. Uh, we're going to do one all about Hermes. Again, so much myths about Hermes. You thought there was a lot about Apollo? There's even more about Hermes. So I'm just going to kind of give an oversight, talk about a few things. We'll talk about Hermes more in other episodes. And then Friday, it was a toss-up between Asclepios and Pan. And I think I'm going to go, we're doing Pan. Because Pan, I, I was combining gods there. The first episode was Apollo and Asclepius. Second episode was Hermes and Pan. We're giving Pan his own episode. We'll do Asclepius some other time. But Eros, yeah, how have I not done an episode on Eros yet? And I can talk about both Eros. Primordial Eros and then like diaper baby Eros. And then grown up Eros and all the Eroses. Um, let's see what else we got. Circe, that's another great one. I would definitely love to do Circe. Um, I mean, she's definitely having her moment because of the Madeline Miller book. Uh... Am I ever going to do an Egyptian myth series? People ask me this all the time because I've done the Greek or I'm almost done with the Greek and I'm doing Norse myth. The Egyptian series, <clears throat> Egyptian mythology personally doesn't speak to me the same way the other two mythologies do. And um, I know why. Um, Egyptian mythology, the gods are far more abstracted and remote and removed from human qualities. And the bits that I really enjoy about Greek mythology and Norse mythology is that they act a lot like real people. And when you get into Egyptian mythology, not only are they abstracted in form, you know, like walking around with like the heads of like, you know, like, you know, like Osiris or like, you know, just like they have like animal heads and stuff. They don't behave. It, it's I, okay. They're behaving like humans to a degree, but I would have to take greater liberties with the stories in order to ascribe the same level of human quality I enjoy in my stories to them. Um, if you want to see my take on the Egyptian gods, I recommend you pick up a copy of my book, uh, Hermes, Tales of the Trickster, because there is in that story is the Greek myth that explains where Egyptian gods come from. Because, like I said, if you live in a pantheistic society, you didn't assume other people were wrong. You assumed they had gods, too. And so the Greeks are like, well, the Egyptians have gods. We have gods. And spoilers, they decided it was the same gods, just that the, uh, the Olympians went to Egypt and turned into animals. So I have a little bit of a little bit in there. I don't know if I'll ever do an Egyptian one. Um, I hope somebody does. And somebody has even sent me some amazing art where they did um, some covers of like, uh, I think it was an Osiris uh, graphic novel, like they had a pitch for it, so to speak, like done with like the Olympians trade dress. I have to find that because I don't think I ever showed that on this, on this show. It was great. Um, I hope somebody does do an Egyptian one. I'm just not sure that person should be me. Um, you know I'm here for Cersei George, yes. Um, isn't Phoebus the Roman equivalent to Apollo? So you will see Apollo listed, like referred to as Phoebus, but that's actually, it's just, it's similar to the way Pluto is, but it's a Greek word too. Like the Greeks would call him, you know, cause we got into this. He would be more like Pluton in uh, Greek, but Pluto is a Greek word. It means the wealthy one, right? So um, Phoebus, you will sometimes see the Romans just call him Phoebus for short, but you also see the Greeks just call him that sometimes for short. He just doesn't really have the, uh, he doesn't have the pre-existing Roman equivalent the way that the other uh, gods do. Like, Cetus was around before Demeter was uh, combined with her. Because they, they go back to the same basic root, just different language groups had different names for them. But it was the same people in prehistory worshipping the same 
idea of gods. But Apollo is just an idea that was... We, if there is a Roman equivalent that was pre-existing, we don't know what it is. And we have pretty good records of that stuff, so I feel like he was just he was just a really Greek idea. I mean, it makes sense. The idea... I said up front, and I'm getting close to the end of this, like one of the major factions of his that a lot of people don't think of is, is he is the god of assembly in public. And that's a super Greek idea. And the plagues and stuff, that's something that like it makes sense. There might have been some equivalent in that in Rome. But like the real core idea of Apollo as people coming together as a people. And then these other aspects. And also the music and like the poetry stuff. That's another thing that's not super Roman. He's got real Greek concepts at his core. Uh, could you do an episode on source material? Just the best books from North Origins. You know, that's a great idea. I should just do an episode where I just kind of, because I eventually want to do like, I want to do an episode where I just do an in-depth exploration of my Lego Olympians up there. <laughs> I'll do a week where I'm just like going to just talk about like some of the myths. To, that would be a great idea. Might be a little bit boring because it'll just be me doing citations. So I'll have to break it up with some fun little drawings or something. But that'd be great just to share some of the sources that I've gone to the most. Like at this point, you've all heard me say like he's here at first and all these people. I always mention these things. It'd be great to see some of the books that you can actually, um, you know, see with them. Who would win in an archery contest, Artemis or Apollo? Hmm. <laughs> uh, okay. This is personal opinion here. Um, I feel like Artemis would. Now, it's almost a moot point because they're both Olympians. And I think when it comes down to an Olympian can do whatever they want to. And if Apollo's like, I want to shoot an arrow behind my head, goes around the sun, zips back, and hits a ladybug on, like, you know, some dude's lap. Well, that would be bad if that dude's lap. Like, he could do it. But because archery is such a key aspect of her general overview, she is the goddess of the wilds and wild animals and hunting and stuff like that. I feel like she has a lot more use. He's still an amazing archer. He could do whatever he wants with it. But the archery doesn't play as big a part in the poetry, in the assembly. Um, he uses the, the arrows very famously. Um, he shoots, like, his plague manifests, his arrows manifest as, like, a fever that burns you up. Like, so he shoots you with that. He brings the plague with the arrows. But it's less a point, and it's less, like, the precision. So I feel like Artemis has the issue. Like, she, it's like they're both, they could do whatever, but he spent more time. Um, I saw somebody asking if there's a way they can catch past live videos. Everything except for, well, the first in, the first two episodes has been archived up on my YouTube channel. So you can see them all up there. Um, this one, I, if you didn't catch the first part, this episode is actually, look at my fancy sign I made. This episode is a redo because I lost the first episode. So I'm redoing Apollo. Tomorrow, on Wednesday, I'm going to be redoing Hermes. But uh, it's, it's an archive up there. There's got to be, gosh, I don't know, because this has been going on so long. There's a bunch of videos now. Um, so you can see that up there. And she's the goddess of the hunt, right? Yes. So I think, all right, I only have two minutes left. So I think I actually have to end this because this thing cuts off very abruptly after an hour. So yeah, the, the, the uh, countdown just started. So everybody, I want to say thank you so much for tuning in to the uh, first episode of Redo Week where we talked about Apollo. Um, certainly a god with some uh, personality issues, but one of my personal favorites. And I'm really glad I got a chance to revisit him again. And we'll definitely be talking about more because we only scratched the surface of Apollo. Like I said, a very much a god of our times. Please join me back here again at 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on Wednesday when we go into my absolute favorite of all the Olympians, of all the gods, Hermes. And I'll see you all then. All right, bye-bye.